Now we come to a story which I'm not remotely ashamed to say. I I'm basically going to hand over to you for Andy, and so much as this this treads in uh, areas that are a little bit sensitive, but also areas that we have touched on in the past. So in that sense, I, I'm familiar with it, and just like a wise person knows what they don't know, I I'm in this instance uh, I'm acknowledging my limitations. And this is the story that 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 uh, that's that's come from the pipeline where history is tomorrow's news. Of, I what that is. I don't know, some, some some strange person runs that website. I've 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 never been. Oh able yeah, to... it's it's yeah, it's, 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 like, it's fake news. It's one of those dodgy, yeah, yeah, one of those weird blog, blog type, type places. Yeah. News websites. Yeah, dodgy, dodgy. But anyway, they've got an interesting headline, um, and that is uh, that Latvian group Legenda has been told to cease and desist in search for lost RN, or as you were saying, uh, or confirmed to me uh, just earlier, Royal Navy personnel. And uh, I'm curious, what is going on in this uh, in this particular news story? It's a very good question. What is going on is that on Friday, uh, last Friday in, in, in June the 26th, uh, Legenda, which is a self-styled archaeology group uh, in Latvia, in one of the Baltic states, um, announced it was going to live stream the search for the what it said was the lost grave of two Royal Navy sailors who were killed in action in 1919 during the British intervention in the Russian Civil War. At that time, Latvia was part of, of Russia. OK. Um, now, this immediately piqued the interest of a number of UK based archaeologists who spotted the posting on Facebook mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because this would be a very unusual situation. Apart from anything else, the British government doesn't allow people to go off casually looking for its uh, or doesn't like, um, doesn't condone people going off casually looking for its missing service personnel. Mm -hmm. um, and the consequence was uh, I, I got tipped off about this and rang up uh, and contact and emailed the two organizations in the UK that are responsible for missing service personnel. That's the uh, Joint Casualty and Compassionate Center, which is part of the Ministry of Defense mm -hmm. based in Gloucestershire, um, who look after the family, the remains of casualties and the families of casualties, mm. uh, historic casualties, as well as uh, 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 as current uh, serving members of the armed forces, uh, and, and people might be um, familiar with the work that they do. To, I mean, to, as we speak today is the uh, on the first of July. It's the anniversary of the Battle of the Somme, mm -hmm. and J Triple C is still working to identify the remains of British soldiers and Commonwealth soldiers who were found on the Somme battlefields uh, today. Mm -hmm. They are then handed over. The remains are then handed over to the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, which looks after the actual resting places on land mm -hmm. of British and Commonwealth service personnel. Uh, it turned out that neither of those organisations knew that this was going on. No. Legenda had not sought permission, they not sought advice, and in fact the um, Commonwealth War Graves Commission told me that had they been asked for their advice, they would have said that actually they were probably chasing a bit of a myth anyway because they suspected that the two sailors that were allegedly missing from a a grave where they've been buried uh, by local people as as drowned sailors washed up on shore um had a, they had actually almost certainly been exhumed and relocated to the commonwealth war, war graves cemetery in latvia in the 1920s right I see. so um so basically they were saying that um L legenda's research was incomplete mm. um i is very polite of them that's a very <laughs> polite way of putting it, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, the, the the bit that was less polite was that the Commonwealth War Graves Commission said that it, uh, which obviously has representation in Latvia because it has a cemetery in Latvia, mm -hmm. um, contacted Legenda and basically said cease and desist. Right. We do not support what you're doing. One of the reasons they don't support what they're doing, uh, what they were doing, and uh, Joe Triple C um, echoed this vehemently. Because they called it disrespectful. Um, was that the excavation was being live streamed on mm -hmm. Facebook mm -hmm. um, alongside appeals for funds uh, to their PayPal account. Mm -hmm. And the uh, British policy is not to show the remains of service personnel. So, for example, had they actually found anything, in fact, all they found were 
a few relics of World War Two mm. and uh, the skeleton of a dog. Um, but uh, they had they found uh, actual remains. We know from other videos that they published, they would have shown the excavation of those uh, the, the, those individuals. Uh, and um, the, given that only uh, 19, I think it is, British um, sailors were lost at that time, um, there may well, you know, those individuals might well be able to be A, identified, and secondly, they may have living relatives, which is why the British authorities are, are sensitive about these things. Yeah. Well, so but, but basically, also, so it's also it's worthwhile just saying because some people may uh, may not know this. Um, but also, when you're handling human remains, even in uh, in a non battlefield context or conflict context, often yeah. there are provisions made for the handling of those remains. So, uh, we've touched on this mm. various times in watching brief. But here in the UK, the Home Office issues, issues you a license, and that dictates how you are able to handle those remains. And one of the provisions is Absol to do with how you do not put them on display, for example. In absolutely, you know, in, in, uh, exactly, um, exactly for, for, for issues of sensitivity, because some people, particularly some religious groups, don't find it offensive. Um, well, and all, to, to, yeah, and also, and also and, it's, it's just to do with taste and decency as well, isn't it, really? It is to do with taste and decency. Mm. So basically, um, thoroughly bad form, it would be a, one way of summing this up. Um, I, 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 and I know so, um, serving um, some service personnel that I've spoken to about this were, again, very uh, offended by the idea that La, uh, Legenda had taken it upon themselves to do this without mm. um, apparently talking to the British authorities. Now, it, in fairness, Legenda said on their Facebook um, stream that they uh, were acting um, with the knowledge of the Lithuanian, uh, the Latvian Ministry of Defence, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and uh, who've been contact, in, in contact with the British Ministry of Defence. Um, as I say, that was contradicted by what I was told. Um, I've asked Legenda about this directly through their published um, messenger of, and accounts and emails, and they so far have chosen not to comment. Right. Now, there's, there is a wider issue here, and it's the issue of how nation states treat their missing service personnel from uh, all, effectively, modern wars, is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, for example, the Americans have a much more active policy. They have a, a, a department, a, um, a section of the de their Department of Defense, which deals with missing POWs and service personnel, and they actually employ... Uh, either directly or on a contract basis, archaeologists, anthropologists, and they actually do do field work. British don't do that. No. Um, they have had the policy since uh, the First World War that British personnel who are lost on active duty are buried in the theatre where they're lost. Yeah. Um, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission looks after the graves, um, and uh, but there is no policy of actively seeking out casualties. What they do do is, if casualties are found, and I talked about the Somme earlier, um, they uh, use their best endeavours to identify the remains um, through desktop research and uh, work, and uh, sometimes even um, DNA work. But um, you know, it, it, it's not an active policy to actually go looking now so, uh, uh, and this is where people, groups like the gender fit in mm -hmm. because they claim that they just uh, that their work is justified because they're providing families with closure and soldiers with marked graves <sighs> yeah yeah the thing is the, the the provision um from what i understand for not going looking is mm -hmm. partly practicality and partly one of um respect in so much as um, first of all, the British Empire covered an awful lot of the world, and in the First and Second World Wars and other wars, other conflicts that the, that the Brits have been involved in, um, we've we've been almost everywhere, and so therefore actually, and we've fought almost everywhere for better or worse, and so therefore actually going out yeah. and looking is is would be a huge undertaking for all all remains. The second thing as well is that I mean, and, you, and you've hinted at this in this conversation is that. Um, the notion is that that where uh, where the soldiers fall essentially becomes, for want of a better word, a sacred uh, a sacred site. It becomes a that 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 the theatre, as you say, but also the, the particular battlefield itself is the the the, impl the, the idea is not to go sh sh truffle hunting through 
a, a place of conflict. And and also, I, I, yes. I imagine, I, I don't know if this is true, but I imagine part of it, that as well, is to do with the fact that uh, you're going to find people who aren't, as it were, from your side, inverted commas, when you do that. And so the question is, mm. what do you do with those remains? It's not like you can, you can Absolutely. in all good conscience, treat them with less reverence. And therefore, it is probably a good policy to leave uh, to leave bodies where where they lay, or where or in, in these complicated scenarios, yeah. So it so yeah. it's, it is complex, but there there are good reasons for for the British policy. And, and the reason why I'm saying that is just to say that it it might, might sound cold compared to the U.S. notion of actually you know leaving no one behind, bringing returning them to home, and this kind of thing. But there are there are equally good reasons for the British policy. Um, is is that, is that where the story be... ends, or or what? Um, I don't know if it is. I mean, just to put that that, yeah. that um, issue of um, searching in, in, in perspective, there are tens of thousands of British casualties who are missing just in the Ypres salient of the First World War alone. Yeah. So uh, the idea that it would be possible to go out, recover the remains of those missing personnel, and then re return them, uh, identify them all, and... Or, or as many as you can, and you know, return them to their homes, their families. Um, it's it really doesn't fly. No. So we we have a, we have these moral compromises. It's also worth saying that under the Geneva Conventions, uh, the rules of war, the international rules of war, um, there are provisions for protecting military graves, yeah. war graves, mm. certainly on land, not at sea, but certainly on land. Mm. So yeah, we're into we're into le into legal territory here too, mm. and um, at the same time in Latvia, and again uh, I've looked into this um, because Latvia first came across our radar, my radar, when um, we were researching what had gone on during the making of um, the program that must not be named, i.e. <coughs> Nazi war diggers. Um, or uh, battlefield because, recovery, as it's now battlefield recovery, yes. as it was um, rebranded. Yeah, it, it was uh, yeah. The, the the hand sanitizer was applied, mm. and um, the the rubber gloves, and it was renamed battlefield recovery. Mm. Um, Legenda were the group that was facilitating access to sites in Latvia for four of the episodes. Right, right. Um, and. They have in the past, for example, offered participation in one of their excavations as a raffle prize. And they've also offered a battlefield relic as a prize in that raffle, although they specified that it, was, it wasn't a, a relic from a site where human remains have been discovered. So there's a, there's a blurring of what is battlefield digging and what is the recovery of uh, human remains out of respect for those soldiers and their families. Well, and also what is profiteering? You might say that I couldn't possibly comment. Well, I'm just, I, well, okay, I'm saying that as someone observing the notion of a raffle as something that makes money, <laughs> if that's what I mean. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. 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 Legenda would say that they're, 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 they're um, an organisation made up of volunteers and they have to fund their work, they have to you know, supply diesel for their vans and so on. Mm, okay. Um, uh, yeah, obviously, we, 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 you know, this is, that is the story, and we, we've covered it, but just out, just out of interest then, is, are you in a position to be able to comment on the extent to which people act in good faith in these sorts of scenarios? That is to say, not specifically talking about Legenda necessarily, are people who get involved in these sort of voluntary organisations often very earnest and wanting to, to actually do what they say they want to do? Or... Is a lot of this activity often tainted by, for example, things like raffles, prizes, sales, and PayPal accounts, etc.? Um, I can say for definite that people find the uh, moral space to do both in their heads. Okay. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. that, 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 that they say that they are, you know, they recover take part in recovery operations for uh, 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 for agenda um, and other groups um, and uh, you know, campaign for the Ministry of Defence to be more proactive in recovering, for example, air crew from the Battle of Britain, mm -hmm. um, uh, which has, has been one of the areas of friction with, between some uh, some historians and military, um, military collectors and enthusiasts and, and the Ministry of Defence. Um, but uh, uh, they also... Uh, 
find it in themselves to be uh, to both search and collect in their own right on battlefields and also buy material that has been recovered by digging from those battlefields and not always legally, particularly if it's coming from France and Belgium. Right, okay. Okay. Um, well, as an, as an additional element then, following on from my, my query there, because it, 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 it is interesting as much as there will be, as you say, there will be legitimate people and legitimate campaigns mm. who genuinely believe that it's possible to hold a certain cognitive dissonance in, in place. Mm. Um, there's, there's an additional news story here um, from the BBC uh, with the headline, uh, Trio who dumped mustard gas in Woodhall Spa Lake have been sentenced. And um, yes. this... Uh, I mean, on the face of it, this seems to be an astonishing, astonishing thing to do. Because, uh, because, well, again, this this is where again I I sort of I um, relinquish the the dance floor to you. In so much as, I mean, no, I mean, in so much as seriously, yeah. I mean, how serious is it? Dumping mustard gas in a lake is it, it? Presumably, this is from the from at least you know, fifty if not a hundred years ago. Um, would it would it be safe? Can it be inert? You know what what's going on there? No, right, no, okay, um, you. If you're a legitimate uh, conflict archaeologist and you're working on sites where uh, that kind of material can be present, and that can be almost any site, because this was a uh, this material was post-war and at a, a, a former RAF base, Woodhall Spa. Mm. Um, so on the face of it, uh, it, it you know, it, you wonder what, how's this stuff here? Mm. Um, in fact, the British Armed Forces trained with mustard and prepared to use mustard in world war one and world war two and right the way down to and, and in fact um eod operators and so on still were uh, trained on how to deal with it simply because this stuff is out there and exists in the environment not necessarily expecting anyone to actually use it although again it has been used illegally under international law for example during the iraq iran war in the 1980s mm. well and also um, possibly more recently in in um uh, oh, in syria Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, no, I, I, absolutely. That is the most yeah. recent yeah. case, and, and, and there was an, a, a massively expensive international effort to try and remove um, Syria's declared chemical weapons mm. stock. Yeah. Um, in case it fell into uh, the wrong hands, um, and then that is why this this case was taken so seriously by the prosecuting authorities. Not only was the clean up uh, did the clean up cost hundreds of thousands of pounds and, and many person hours, uh, the person the principal in this case um who was found guilty was sentenced to five years uh, for possession of a chemical weapon yeah they took they, they basically uh, that this is a sort of pour and croger les autres mm. uh charging and sentencing they but they put historic england crown prosecution service the police the uh, the, the um ministry of defense they're putting down a marker to mm. people who go out and dig military archaeology for artifacts which is primarily metal detectorists mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they're basically saying don't mess with this stuff because this is what could happen to you yeah well and presumably they're partly doing that for for the safety of everyone involved as well um, yes yeah precisely yeah yeah so, yeah so it's not yeah. it's not, it's not <laughs> just punitive it's also c no. containing yeah hmm. The, the, these people were not only stupid enough to dig for the stuff in the first place and to then remove it from the site they actually contaminated themselves Oh, did they? Right, oh, blimey. Right. And one of, yeah, right. yeah. Um, and, 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 and there was a multi-location decontamination exercise that went on after this was discovered. Oh, because they went to other uh, places while contaminated. Their, right. their, ho their home, you know, homes, uh, places, you know. Uh, yeah, okay, you know, it, it's a dirty secret that Britain had chemical weapons stocks, mm -hmm. uh, even after chemical weapons were made illegal under the international law we talked about earlier um and the geneva conventions um yeah it was it was kept as a uh, for, for quote deterrent purposes but if you look at the uh, for example um alan brooks diaries general Sir alan brook um who was the who would have been the commander of the british forces had there been an invasion in the summer of 1940 mm -hmm. you know, 80 years ago as we speak um the raf and the Brit and the war office made active preparations for using mustard gas on the invasion beaches right i see i see okay. so, on, on the on the german army as they came ashore yeah. so you know this, this is this is it, it, it is one of the days you know I, i've got a, a wartime manual that describes using mustard gas to contaminate things like power station control rooms and so on as a as a, as a 
delaying device as a, as a, a denial device uh, if, if you're forced to give up territory in the event of an invasion. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah no, that makes sense. Yes, okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and in fact, there was so, a, there was, well, uh, presumably it has the advantage of not having to destroy your own infrastructure but you deny the use of it to other people, right? Precisely, precisely. And, and, and there was a huge factory at Rhythian in Wales which was making this stuff right the way through the war. And in fact, there's a very good report, that was archaeological report that was done on it a few years ago. Right. Um, so, um, but obviously that, that report had to be done very carefully because of potential contamination issues. Mm. So, you know, th this, is, this is not a game. This is not stuff to be played with. Um, but... Again, any of us, any of us that do industrial archaeology and conflict archaeology, know that when you're dealing with former sites, sites where weapons were stored, and sites where uh, things were made and process, industrial processes were undertaken in the past, former gasworks sites, mm. where you find ground contamination, you know, of, uh, of, you know phenol, cyanide, you know, all all kinds of things uh, are out there, and you mess with them at your peril. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay, yeah. <laughs> um, so, th sorry. The reason why I say that is I like that is just to, is essentially not only is, is this uh, uh, because basically we started in a place where we're talking about morals and ethics, and we've ended in a place where we're talking about actually morals, ethics, best practice, and best practice existing for the purposes of, of preserving human life. So, absolutely, yeah, yeah, very serious. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah.